no. Hello and welcome to Radio Zindagi. I am with you, Ira, and welcome to Confessions of the Futurist with Sanjeev Koyal. We are live on Radio Zindagi 92.3 FM HD2 and we are also live on the Radio Zindagi Facebook page. Listeners, we all know Sanjeev Goyal joins us here every Wednesday at this time. And a lot of us, in fact, most of us also know Sanjeev Goyal pretty well. But those of you who do not, well, Sanjeev Goyal is a well-known name in the industry. He is an inspiration, a futurist, an angel investor, and a Silicon Valley entrepreneur. And we're so proud to have him on Radio Zindagi to inspire our listeners and friends in the Bay Area. This program is supported by Droices, NTTVC, and the IIT Delhi Excellence Foundation. So while I welcome Sanjeev on air with us, I also take this opportunity to welcome Sanjeev Poonan on Radio Zindagi. Sanjeev, thank you so much for bringing him. And Sanjeev, welcome to Radio Zindagi. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Sanjeev, thank you, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so this journey started a few months ago when people asked me, Sanjeev, what is your next plan? And the big question everybody asked me how are we going to solve the problem of 3 billion more people? That means 10 billion people by 2050. And I started my journey to look for mavericks and futurists who are solving this problem on the day, every single day basis. And based on my research, I found Sanjay Poonan. Sanjay is formerly the president of SAP. He was CEO of VMware. Both the companies are household names. Sanjay is a household name in Silicon Valley. Pretty much everybody I know, he knows him. And uh, the work he has done is phenomenal. He has built multi-billion dollar companies, grew them from a few million dollars. So Sanjay has developed a methodology, I should call it, to predict future. Let's bring him on the show and ask him, how is he predicting the future? Sanjay, welcome to our show. Thank you. We have the Sanjay and Sanjeev show now. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's fun. So Sanjay, I have a lot of questions, but uh, my first question is the most difficult question. Do you have a confession for our audience? Um, well, where do you start? Um, you Just know, one. <laughs> uh, I have a sweet tooth. So, uh -oh. I mean, as much as I've tried, you know, we all make our New Year's vows, and then you know um, we we try to keep them for more than one day. Um, and uh, you know, I, I typically have a soft spot for anything sweet, especially chocolate. And I think with the sort of an Indian upbringing, all of us have some form of favorite um, Indian dessert. So some any form of sweet dessert. So I've always I can do well on most of the other eating habits, but the part that usually gets me in trouble is some form of dessert. So where did you grow up in India, Sanjay? I grew up in Bangalore. I'm, my parents are uh, originally from Kerala, uh, but my dad was um, you know, in Delhi and then went to the military. My mom was from Kunur and went, went to medical cause and actually was actually working in a leprosy mission hospital. So um, wow. most of my growing up uh, years was in Bangalore and I lived there practically the first 18 years of my life. Uh, before I came to the United States on a scholarship to go to college. Wow, that's awesome. And congratulations on getting a scholarship. It was all really tough time. In the, in the late 1980s, uh, which is when I came to the United States, it was very rare. Most people came to the U.S. as graduate students, but there were a few universities in the, the U.S. I mean, we, we there's no way my parents could have afforded sending me to uh, a college, much less Dartmouth College. Um, you know, we were, I would say, middle to lower middle class by Indian standards and certainly poor by American standards. Uh, but there were a few universities who were offering international student scholarships and Dartmouth was one of them. And I was very grateful because I wanted to study computer science and they had a really good computer science program. So I was very grateful for that opportunity. So it's interesting, I find it, and I talk to a lot of people, especially from IIT network I have. And, uh, you know, we all go, through engineering program. I even did masters, you did masters. And then we get into the management. So how that transition happened and how the engineering training helps us build companies like SAP and uh, VMware. Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Yeah, I mean, um, you know, sort of small, maybe it's a minor confession, uh, but since we have a lot of IIT grads who are probably listening into this show, um, uh, I think preparing for the IITs in my 10th, 11th, and 12th standard in India was the best thing I ever did. Um, and I, I mean, I didn't talk about this because I don't want people to feel like <laughs> I, I rejected I, IIT. I got admitted to IIT Madras to study electrical engineering, and I that would have oh, wow. been my choice of where I would have gone. And all the preparation that I did, uh, you know, I don't remember Brilliant and Agarwal tutorials, all these things that I did in my 10th, 11th, and 12th were very helpful to me. Uh, I think the only reason I came to the United States was I wanted to study computer science. And I think in, in IIT at the time, in the late 1980s, you had to be in the top 50 ranks. And I think I was ranked 180 or something like that. And I wanted to study computer science. If you weren't ranked in the top 50, you didn't get computer science. Of course, people could switch in their second or third year. Um, but I would have gone to IIT Madras and I um, have no regrets of the preparation that I did because when I got to Dartmouth College, as an undergrad, I was placing into junior level, that's third year level oh. physics and math because of the preparation. Uh, that's impressive, IITs, actually. Tremendous respect. I think the IITs are certainly one of the best technical universities in the world. And the preparation that anybody who got into IIT, uh, um, and even those who prepared and didn't get into, but prepared for the, those, those uh, that level of preparation, I think is world-class. So, uh, talking about the framework to predict future, and we briefly talked before the show too. So we all know the global population is growing. Uh, we are expected to be 10 billion people by 2050. Last 18 months is really tough for humanity because COVID has really pushed us to limits we find we are more interconnected. We try to isolate ourselves, which New Zealand has done, Australia is still doing it. And we are figuring it out how we can live in isolation, but the reality is the isolation is not working. The whole world is really connected and the virus is still going on. Now we have Delta variant. Uh, prior to there were different variants. So this continue, this is going on. However, to my utter surprise, every single infrastructural service has worked including financial institutions. And company like, companies like VMware, SAP, uh, Salesforce, a lot of other companies made it possible. So we both know the foundational layer or the foundational work done by you and a lot of people in the tech space, especially in the last three decades is working. But I don't believe it's going to take us to the future. So what do you think we should be doing today to get there? Yeah, I think, Sanjeev, the first thing to realize, um, as the world gets to 2050 and we grow, you know, to whatever, you know, 10 billion North people, um, the location and the density of where those people are is also going to change. I mean, people traditionally thought, you know, the biggest countries are China, India, United States, Brazil, you know, and then you get to parts of uh, yeah, break. Indonesia. Yeah, basically we talk so about but when you think about where the population is growing the fastest, it's not going to be India and China. China, in fact, is slowing down. India will slow down some. It's going to be countries like Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, some countries in, in, in uh, Africa. Uh, and Europe's going to be on a decline. Japan's going to be on a decline. Uh, U.S. will probably stabilize except for some immigration-based growth. I mean, it is going to be a different world. And I think we have to look both at where the, the population, uh, sorry, how the population is growing and where they're growing to understand um, how do we ensure that the planet, whatever size it is, um, that it's a land of opportunity for everybody. And to me, there's certain immutable that I hope the world will focus on. Number one, um, my hope is that, you know, basic food, uh, nutrition, malnutrition and nutrition and all the kinds of things that have made tremendous progress so that no one should starve. The whole food basis, because we need food and shelter as a basic form of living, that every country will be able to provide food and shelter to all their citizens. That's a necessity of life. Um, and my hope is by that point in time, every country, whether you are below you know, a developing country or what's traditionally called a developed first world economy, everyone will be able to provide food and shelter to all citizens. That's a, that in itself, the toll task was even in the United States, we have a lot of homeless people. But if you go to Africa, 
parts of India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, there is a lot of malnutrition and, uh, and, and homelessness, which is the other uh, dimension. So those are ones that I hope that the combination of the countries, philanthropists will solve, and it's a super important part for society. Uh, secondly, I think that a, a, the grand equalizer for everybody is education. And my hope is that, I mean, what got me to come to this country was education. What's provided me the opportunity to do more, whether it's VMware or SAP or all the companies I did before was the- Well, education is the biggest equalizer. We know that. I mean, without Absolutely. education, that's the best way. And that's the only every, way we can bring social equity. Every country should provide basic high school education and then hopefully the access to college education because it does provide. Um, and then I think the third in that education uh, I think science, technology, engineering, math, the STEM discipline, certain basic principles, coding, logic, all those types of things, I think provide us then the foundation to allow then innovation in a variety of, of countries. And I would love to see the most populated countries, not the, just the traditional, I mean, people think of US, India, China as the places where a lot of the innovation is happening, but the Indonesia's, the Brazil's, the Pakistan's, the Bangladesh's, the uh, Nigeria's, there's many countries with large, rapidly growing populations as a world citizen we need those countries to start showing up with innovation uh with companies inside those countries that are innovative True. as opposed to all of the action happening just uh in, in the western world yeah and and i think that's very much possible what do you need you need a lot of uh, you know you need a vibrant population which many of those countries have as a result of they have, they have gdp and they need education to provide enough stem based education to key uh, age groups. And especially in some of those countries, Indonesia, Nigeria, um, and so on, there's a younger population uh, that absolutely should be trained in science, technology, engineering, math, and they are the future of this world. So I do agree with you, Sanjay, on that. We both are, uh, that education is the biggest equalizer. But let's talk about us as a technologist in Silicon Valley, because most of our audience are from Silicon Valley. And uh, how can we work here and create an infrastructure or technology which is future ready? And let's talk about five years because 20, 25 years is very hard to predict in today's age. So five years, six years from now, what you see and what are the major growth areas in terms of technology we have? Uh, because now Starlink is coming. Now we both know that based on the initial success, I won't be surprised if we have million satellites. I don't think it's a good idea, but it may happen. Now what will happen to the telecom infrastructure? It can be completely disrupted because if I have my own satellite, why do I need to work with T-Mobile or anybody else? I have 5G, 10G, whatever it is, anywhere I go on planet. So there are a lot of interesting dynamics are there which is going to play uh, role in uh, future of technology. So where do you see technology is going? Yeah, I, you know, Sanjeev, I wrote a blog about this that any of your listeners are welcome to uh, to read. If you just search on Poonin uh, predictions for 2021 and beyond, I wrote that at the beginning of this year, sort of my happy new year sort of predictions of the future. And there's I, 10 predictions I make. I'll just make a couple of them. I think the notion of cloud computing is here to stay. And increasingly, applications, uh, infrastructure, workloads, people are going to be building in cloud computing constructs. That's only going to grow. And there's going to be a tectonic shift of IT uh, investments there. Uh, I talked about a significant advance in cybersecurity. Um, the, the bad guys have been seized. And quite frankly, it takes a village um, of, of cybersecurity companies. Many of these security companies now are going to be, uh, you know, hot companies of the future. I think this notion of work from anywhere, you know, it's sort of in the Silicon Valley, people are leaving California to go to other states, living anywhere because they can work from anywhere. I have, for the first time ever, people open to doing their job, you know, in some remote part and the company's willing to handle that. So I, I, I had three of, sorry, 10 such predictions that I'd encourage people to read, but I would say there's some basic fundamentals to it that are key forces. Um, that are going to be driving this cloud computing, uh, artificial intelligence, mobile. Um, you know, these are our key advents. And if you are a technologist and a futurist uh, or an innovator, I would encourage you to be at the uh, vortex 
of these innovations and then pick an area that you're, for example, if you are really interested in the junction of security and artificial intelligence, there's some incredible innovation going on in that area. If you're interested in cloud computing and the future of how applications are going to be built in the cloud, there's some incredible innovation happening there, whether it's at big companies and small companies. And I think, you know, the other piece that I'm very intrigued, intrigued by is the innovations that are going to fundamentally change lives. I've been very interested in the healthcare industry recently. Uh, I mean, COVID's taught me a lot about life sciences and, and healthcare. And healthcare, it's 20% of our GDP. And it's got to be simpler, easier, you know, telemedicine should be accessible to everybody. I shouldn't have to go into the hospital. Uh, so much about the way everything from the patient, to the provider, to the payer, to life sciences company, that entire supply chain, I think is ripe for some, some incredible innovation and disruption. So, I mean, if I was a young 22 year old joining the workforce today. Yeah, it's still uh, 22. What are you talking about? It, it's tremendously promising, Sanjeev. And I think for the young grads who are joining the millennials, this is the best time to be in technology because you have all of the confluence of these forces. Pick an area, pick an industry that you want to make an impact in, find people who can mentor you and just dive into the deep end of the pool and start swimming and you're going to be an innovator. I mean, that's the challenge to everybody that um, now anybody could do it. I mean, you just look at, I mean, I'll give you one example. Uh, Eric Yuan is a good friend of mine. He is the CEO of Zoom. Um, I don't know, five, seven years ago when he first showed me Zoom and I could get it running on my phone, I flashed back to 2008 when I was at SAP and the financial crisis was going on and we were all huddled around these very hot machines called telepresence machines. Uh, and only a few people could get in the room and emitted a lot of heat. I mean, which was fine if you were in a cold building. It just could it uh, make a lot of money in that. But I will tell you, when I first saw it, I basically said, this is, I told Eric, the Zoom is like telepresence on a phone. And he was able to get the video fidelity and then comes the pandemic and Next thing you know, Zoom's a hundred billion market cap company. Everybody and Zoom's now become a verb. We're doing this session on Zoom. So yeah. I think, you know, and he is an immigrant, uh, you know, from China. I mean, it's, it's his story is remarkable, just like any of ours. Yes, so I think innovation is uh, possible for anybody. You just have to be alert to where the shifts are happening and then go for it. So, uh, you know, I'll uh, quote an interesting conversation I had with my doctor. Uh, Actually, yesterday we had dinner. So he formed a group of uh, doctors in uh, Las Vegas, 100 plus doctors. They are trying to create something around ACO. And then they were talking about why don't we have a large team of people in India? And I started asking him, why do you need a team? And because most of these tasks, even today, can be done through artificial intelligence, because understanding the data and responding in a human voice is not a big deal nowadays, it's already there. However, what I'm finding, Sanjay, is there is a lot of reluctance in adopting these technologies. So when we talk about uh, AI, when we talk about ML, when we talk about even computer vision, the, there is a lot of challenge. So what I'm finding as a problem is stakeholders. So technologists, build, uh, somebody who understands business, uh, uh, government, or other stakeholders that they are not on the common platform or they are not ready to collaborate together. How you were able to solve that problem in VMware? Because you have a similar problem. You are putting, uh, VMware is pretty much like every single uh, place today. Yeah, I think when it comes to collaboration and the way in which you work, uh, there's a mindset to how people need to be thinking about prioritizing not their own ideas, but consultatively getting input of ideas. I mean, listen, you know, how do you, we're all made with two ears and one mouth because I think we should be listening more than we're talking. So that means that I respect the people who ask the most insightful questions of somebody else that gets information out of them. They're in naturally inquisitive, they're curious. They're always looking for how they could learn from others. That, that growth mindset sort of their, you know, always what pervades their, their skin and their bones and their blood. Um, and I think we want to first build a culture of such people in an organization that are naturally inquisitive. They're always asking questions. They're, they're curious. And then they act on the knowledge that they're just kind of asking questions, getting knowledge in your head. You have to digest it. Uh, and then you kind of want to build the tools, whether it's, you know, uh, collaboration tools, Slack, Zoom, uh, Teams, whatever have you, that yeah, that's, that's, to become that's much a tool. more than a, a email type of culture. 
Um, and you know, sometimes it is, isn't just the electronics of it. You just need to go and have a dinner with people. So I just encourage people realize that the power of an organization comes from great people building great teams, which build great companies. And if you just have great individuals who can't really operate together, it's like having a football team where people don't know how to pass the ball pretty well together, or, you know, ultimately those types of teams don't do well. So in any sport, it's the same thing in any business, the best teams win. Uh, you got to be comfortable as a leader, as a manager, to hire people who are smarter than you. Many managers are very intimidated by that statement because they feel like that person is going to threaten them for the job. I mean, to me, if you can't hire somebody better than you, it's like a parent who's being threatened by a kid being better than them. I mean, when my kid can Pretty run much. or or do something better than me, I'm not threatened by them. I'm proud of them. So you want to build a culture where if you're hiring people who are better than you and you're facilitating their process and when you move on to the next thing, you've got a whole line of succession plan. I mean, to me, those are proud moments for any leader. Yeah. No, I cannot. Uh, I definitely echo that. I talk to a lot of IIT students nowadays and really I'm amazed the way they process information. That is that just blows me away that how they see the things, how they see the world, how they want to solve the problem. It's absolutely uh, phenomenal, phenomenal. So uh, one very, uh, one question I have, a quick question for you is, do you have any specific advice for our audience? Because most of our audience are either entrepreneur or wannabe entrepreneur, or they really want to understand where the world is going. So we talked a lot about education, we talked about uh, cloud computing, we talked about security, AI, ML, but when it comes to real application, that's where the challenge comes. That how do you create that? How do you even create a prototype to start? Where do they start? Yeah, I would, I mean, I encourage people to pick in, I mean, while those are horizontal technologies, pick an industry that you feel you know pretty well or want to get to know. Let's just say, for example, healthcare. I mean, listen, you know, telemedicine, the way in which uh, way in which healthcare is better optimized. You could just go to a hospital and you can see so many different efficiencies that could be solved better through technology. And from that will come either software idea or medical device ideas. If you're a biochemist, I think the entire world of big data meeting, uh, you know, life sciences, drug companies is going to result in, in cures or at least therapies for cancer, Alzheimer's, variety of, of, of diseases that have kind of long eluded people for the last, you know, many, many decades. So my hope is that technology applied to a particular industry, retail has been completely transformed through e-commerce and, you know, uh, you know, delivery, uh, pickup and things, all those things. The that opportunities need to be are infinite. That, what I'm hearing from you is opportunities are infinite. Yeah. And you just have to pick the industry where you believe you've got a competitive advantage. You have an idea. And the beauty of, of I mean, this country, I think to the same extent in, you know, to in India and China, um, entrepreneurship is alive and well. If you've got a great idea in a particular industry and you could find some, some early customers that you could build a focus group with, um, you know, once you've got product market fit, it's so easy to scale an idea today, given the power of uh, the internet and a variety of other technologies. You know, even today on sales calls, you don't need to travel that much. You could do a lot of your sales meetings intelligently on the web through Zoom. Absolutely, absolutely. Like this kind of conversation earlier, I would have asked you to come to the studio and spend three hours of your time. Today we are doing all this on Zoom. Yeah. And there you go. interestingly enough, is of course you should ask Eric to fix my Zoom because I don't get uh, 1080p. I get 640. So if you can make that happen, I'll be grateful. He gave us 53,000 user account, but we still don't have it. It's interesting. But coming back to this, uh, I do agree with you. The We are just scratching the surface. In fact, I look at the tech. Tech is not even 30 year old. I mean, we really started, we were doing DOS exactly 30 years ago, ago 91, 92. It was all, there was no visual interface. I still remember my first job where I was designing buildings using the DOS operating systems. And it was like, ridiculous. I mean, you know, such a small data set we could manage. And today the data set is growing and it's exponentially growing. So what I'm saying is, or asking is the communication infrastructure built 30 years ago, we are still using same infrastructure. I believe the biggest problem we have it is throughput is a huge issue. The data is, is still not traveling at the speed it should be traveling. In 30 years, we haven't changed much. So 
Can you talk about one thing our audience can do or look into when it comes to really these transactions? Because we have to move fast. We are talking about quantum computing and we are far from that. I mean, that's a very large uh, surface area question, but listen, I, I have hope that, I mean, quantum computing is gonna change the way in which one is able to think about the capacity for compute. At the end of the day, you will be able to solve some intractable problems because you're gonna be able to compute things uh, at ways that go beyond microprocessors. And I'm very hopeful that, you know, whether it's any, any big data problem or, you know, kind of thing that requires a lot of computing in parallel, Will get solved with that and i hope it will then ultimately be applicable to places where it can save lives and make people more efficient um i think that 5g is going to tremendously change the way in which and pace in which data could be communicated not just for gaming and the entertainment purpose so that's you know okay i want to watch movies yeah. or i want to do all that stuff that's all i have these calls remotely but you know the extent that healthcare data x-ray data could be sent to an edge computing the device okay, yeah. and, and sent back. Uh, I mean, again, I start with where can technology help make lives more efficient and save lives? You always want to start with that because everything else is like the dessert part of the meal. The basic parts of the meal that involve us saving lives are where you want it. So the extent that technology could provide food and shelter um, and the basic- The basic necessity. Yeah, and, and, and healthcare to me. I mean, you know, life expectancy, in thousands of years ago was higher and then it got lower. And in the 1900s and 1800s, people were living only 40, 50, 60 years. A lot of people would die young. And Sanjay, I would people... love to continue to talk. Uh, I'm getting, um, so we are at the end of our show. I want to thank you for your time. It's really sure. phenomenal conversation. And hopefully we may get you back and we can talk more about where are you going because I know you are on your next journey. Uh, I want to thank uh, all of our audience and Radio Zanvi for the opportunity and audience especially. Please send your comments and questions on Facebook and I'll be happy to answer. Sanjay will be happy to answer. Thank you very much for your time, Sanjay. Thank you, Sanjay.